said, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of scripture we read just a moment ago. Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 53. The message this morning entitled, The Resurrection and Peace. The Resurrection and Peace. On this bright and glorious morning, and you hear me say this every year, we celebrate the most joyful day since the creation of the world. On that first day of creation, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. On the first day of the week, physical light came into the world. On the first day of the week, Christ rose from the dead, bringing us eternal light and hope and peace. On the first day of the week, the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to fulfill the day of Pentecost, beginning the opening of the door of light that would spread around the world as light comes to the nations when the world turns. On the first day of the week, the church has, since her birth on Pentecost Sunday, celebrated the resurrection of our Lord. However, for the first who heard of the resurrection, there was no hope or joy or peace. Did you pick that up in the passages we read this morning? There was only confusion and fear. Even later when Jesus appeared in the midst of the disciples, there was not only confusion, but there was abject terror. We humbly learn some lessons about ourselves as we look at the women and the apostles on that first resurrection morning. How often we're filled with fear instead of with faith. How often we tremble and shake when we look at the world and our lives through the lens of secular pragmatism, the lens of things that we know are impossible. How often our hearts melt when we fail to see things through the eyes of God's great eternal promises. Let me read just the first part of that passage again in Luke 24 that we read. Jesus says one word to them, and they have a totally different response. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. What a strange response to the words, peace be unto you. Do you remember how Luke 24 began? We didn't read it today, but how it began. It was with a group of women heading to the tomb. Those women had clearly started the day in resigned unbelief. They were practical women. They had seen the sorrow of death before, but even in death, they were faithful. Did you notice it was the women? who followed Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea to the tomb to see where the body of Jesus was buried. Stop and think about this for a moment. We don't often pause to think about what was missing, but there was no funeral. When one of us dies, there is a funeral. 
There was no period of public mourning. John, the beloved apostle, had taken Mary, the mother of Jesus, away to his own home. None of the brothers and sisters of Judas, of Jesus, stayed behind. He had multiple brothers and sisters, according to the scriptures, but we don't see any of them staying behind and going to the tomb. There were no people standing in a group to comfort the family as he was buried. There were no men standing around in small groups talking quietly and reverently. There was no sermon, no reading of the scriptures, no committing of dust to dust and ashes to ashes. There was no pastoral counseling, there was no comfort. There was no viewing or visitation with the family. A lot was missing. There was only the handful of women watching with tears. As Joseph and Nicodemus worked feverishly to get the body into the tomb before Passover began. The remaining 11, who were closest to Jesus, were not even there. With the death of Christ, the men had moved on. That's what men do, you know. They move on. Pragmatists. Grit the teeth. Tough. Show no emotion. Isn't that what everybody expects from a man? Even the remaining disciples are not seen following Joseph and Nicodemus to the tomb. It was the men who followed, the women, excuse me, who followed and watched in sorrow and all with tears. But the men moved on. Here, verse 48. And all the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts. The last two words. And returned. It was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. There were things that had to be done. You know the old saying, a a man do what a man got to do. This chapter was over. The disappointment was bitter, but life had to go on. Pragmatism set in. Reality was reality. Jesus was dead. Got to get moving. Got to fall back into the routine. Can't, Can't show any emotion. Cut off the emotion. It's too confusing. Somebody else will do it. Other people are handling the body. That's not my job. Don't want to see it. Can't handle it. It's over. It's over. Eyes straight forward. What do we do next? Move mechanically. Got to prepare Passover. Dull. Senseless. How wrong we were. Sort it out later. Put it on autopilot. You'll get through this somehow. But the women followed. Look at verse 55 and 56. And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Men were supposed to be the leaders, but the men 
had no idea what to do. So what did they do? They went home. But the women desperately wanted to do something. They had to follow the body of the only one who had ever been a true leader of this pack. They couldn't give up. Their grieving emotions would not give them release just to turn their backs, pack up their feelings, and wander into Jerusalem and disappear. They were women who had buried others, perhaps other loved ones, we see that from what they did after they marked the spot of Jesus' burial, they knew what had to be done for a proper burial. The men had been so busy obeying the law of the Sabbath, making sure they didn't violate the day of rest, that they had to get back and everything done before sunset, that the women were the only ones who were concerned that maybe, just maybe, the burial spices and ointments were not sufficient or properly done by Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. The men are the pragmatists, the realists. Women tend to worry, even when everything's okay. And of course, even though the women were worried, those two followers really had done the job right. John tells us in John 19, 39, that Nicodemus had actually used a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds. Now, some of you here, especially you younger ones, are less than 100 pounds. That means if they put you on one side of the scale and this weight of spices on the other side, it would lift you up. They added a hundred pounds weight to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, carefully wrapped in the linen cloth. You know, that's a huge amount of very expensive spices. But after all, these guys were rich. They could afford it. They knew how to throw money at a problem. It was a spur-of-the-moment decision. They knew that they were risking their lives and reputations to openly identify with Jesus. You remember many chapters before in chapter 3, Nicodemus had come secretly to Jesus by night because he was afraid of the Jews. After all, he at that point was one of the in-crowd. Maybe they both felt a little giddy, guilty that they had not poured out more of their money and resources into the ministry of Jesus while he was still alive. Maybe they were waiting on the sidelines to see how everything would turn out. Maybe they were hedging their bets. But now it was too late to support his ministry. Now it was too late to do anything but wait. We can bury him. It was the last thing they could do for Jesus. But the women still felt compelled to do more. They were not thinking of the decay of the body like practical Martha had done with Lazarus. In their confusion, they had not yet thought the question through of removing the stone from the door of the tomb. They were already on their way there when that thought crossed their mind. They moved mechanically, but carefully and lovingly as they prepared the spices and the ointment. They carefully watched and made a mental mark where Jesus was buried. But then, of course, they too followed the example of the men. They went back to their lodgings someplace in Jerusalem. You know, after all, they probably didn't even have their own house in Jerusalem because the text specifically says that they were from Galilee. They rested the Sabbath day as required by the Mosaic law. Now you know that point is something of great interest in the text. The women who followed to the tomb and who prepared the spices were Galilean women. They were from the far north up by the Sea of Galilee. Look at verse 55, it says so. 
And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how the body was laid. You know, it was in Galilee that Jesus had spent most of his ministry. It was Galilee that most of his disciples called home. So these women were a long way from home. They would have come to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover, probably with their husbands and children. But they did not bring the children to the horror of the crucifixion. We do not see their husbands present. It was the women from Galilee who prepared the spices and ointments, not women from Jerusalem. Most of the women from Jerusalem, no doubt, had hastened to their own homes, which were close by, to weep and prepare for the Passover. But you know, we mustn't be too hard on those women from Jerusalem. The Galilean women were not the only ones who cared. The gospel tells us that certain others came with them the morning of the resurrection. That's in chapter 24, verse 1. And so that probably did include some local women who came to the tomb that morning. But these Galilean women were the prominent ones in the gospel accounts who watched the burial, the faithful ones who marked out the tomb so that they could later find it. So after they had seen where Jesus was buried, together they returned and prepared the spices and ointment. Let me pause for just a moment. I think it is a point of great instruction for us to see who has the greatest strength of character through the different times of testing during Jesus' earthly ministry. Those narratives are examples for us to follow. It is also of great interest to see the strength of character of these Galilean women who bravely return to the tomb after the body normally would have begun to decay. It tells us a great deal about their love, about their devotion, about their selfless sacrifice and their courage. Remember, a group of armed soldiers had been set to guard the tomb. A brutal soldier does not deal gently with helpless, defenseless, unarmed young women in the dark in a remote cemetery where nobody could hear their cries. The women had no idea whether the soldiers were still there. They had no idea that the soldiers had been turned into wobbly, terrified wimps and had run away to the high priest. But when the women arrived, the soldiers were gone. When the women arrived, the stone was rolled away from the tomb. What they worried about as they talked over the problem, what they thought would be their biggest obstacle as they stumbled through the dark to the tomb, had suddenly vanished. Oh, the grace of God. The things that we cannot do to reach Him, He does for us. How can I reach Jesus? Here's grace. The things that we cannot do to reach him, he does for us. The stones that are too big for us to move, he takes out of the way. The women had to walk to the tomb, and they had to carry the spices and ointment. But when they arrived, they found the most marvelous truth in all of history. He was gone. He was risen from the dead. Now think about this for a moment. If they had stayed home like the 11 disciples, they might never have known. And just think, the disciples would never have heard their report. The disciples had no plans to go back to the tomb anytime soon. They were busy working on plan B, which is, where do we hide? If the women had stayed home instead of coming to Jesus, they would not have had the privilege 
of being the first to bear the greatest news in all of the world. <laughs> Did you get that, all of us thick-headed men? Because the women stayed to watch the burial of Jesus while the men went home, God gave the privilege of being the first witnesses to the women. Did you notice something else? The women had no fear of entering the tomb. They were not afraid that they would be ceremonially defiled. We read in John just a moment ago that John, when he got to the tomb, there was hesitation on his part to enter the tomb until Peter barged in first. But the women entered the tomb immediately. After all, they knew they were going to have to do that because they had consciously prepared themselves not only to enter the tomb, but to properly wrap the body with the spices and ointment that they had prepared. But what they found, they did not expect. First, the tomb was open, a cause for the greatest concern. Second, there was no body. Verse 4 says that they were perplexed. That means that they were confused. Now, we don't know all the thoughts that raced through their minds at that split second. Perhaps the Galilean women thought that they'd gone to the wrong place, and those who are called certain others might have thought they were lost as well. Perhaps they wondered where the guards were. Perhaps they wondered if the body had been moved to another location. They were confused. And the text tells us that is precisely what made them afraid. When we think we're lost in the dark, in a strange and spooky place, that makes us afraid also. But you know, God is a gracious God. He does not leave us in perplexity because the scripture specifically says that God is not a God of confusion. He did not design us for chaos, but for peace when we're seeking to serve him in love. Do you remember in John 14 through 16, the upper room discourse, that before the cross, Jesus had promised peace. Jesus himself had designed peace for these ladies he knew the fragile state of these women, their shattered emotions, their breaking point, as suddenly their gentle act of love seemed to be utterly frustrated by an empty tomb. And so he did not leave them to wonder. In his great mercy, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. You know, God sends his angels to minister to those who are the elect, the heirs of salvation, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. We don't always see them as the women did, but the angels are there, ministering to us all the same. They don't speak to us verbally, as they did at that time, they don't give us new revelation because new revelation has ceased. But the book of Hebrews tells us in chapter 13, verse 2, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. And the message of the angels is most practical and obvious. He is not here. <laughs> now, I hope you see the irony in that. Because... That is precisely what had confused the women. He's not here. But then the angels add something that the women did not know. Now they should have known it, but they did not yet have the eyes of faith opened by the one who alone could open the eyes of the blind. And as the blind groping in the dark when a lion roars, can you imagine being blind? You're going through the forest, feeling your way, and suddenly you hear a lion.
they lost it. Suddenly their confusion turned into terror. Confusion and terror! Friends, that's no recipe for peace. They were suddenly afraid. As they'd walked among the tombs and among the dead on their way to find Jesus, they had not been afraid. But suddenly they were confronted, not by the dead, but by the most alive beings they had ever seen in earth, apart from our Lord. And they were afraid. How strange that seems for us now as we dispassionately sit in our easy chairs, sipping our coffee. Fear at the most joyful moment that we could possibly imagine. What a difference our premises make when our emotions put us to the test. The women had been looking for death, and they were braced to face death. But suddenly they were staring face to face with life, and they were not prepared for that. Their emotions were shattered and collapsed in a flash of confusing light. It's like boxing. You're prepared for a left hook, and suddenly you get a powerful right jab to the face. You're not prepared. The angels asked them a very simple question. Why are you looking for a living man among dead men? It was perhaps mildly humorous to the angels. They may have had a smile on their faces. After all, it does seem like an odd thing to be doing if you knew what had happened. Now today we know what happened. We come to the empty tomb with a different set of premises. To us, the empty tomb is a source of joy. But to the women, it was confusion and fear. And so the angels point out the obvious again. He is risen. Certainly you know that. Don't you remember what he told you in Galilee? I, I hope that you don't miss the implication of that statement. Don't you remember what he told you in Galilee? What does that imply? Think about it for a moment. What does that imply? It lets you know that angels listen to conversations on earth. The angels demonstrated that they were listening in on what Jesus had said many miles from the tomb. Even more astounding, they made it clear that they recognized these specific women. They know where they are from, that they are from Galilee. Don't you remember what he told you? We were there, you were in the crowd. You didn't see us, but we saw you. Don't you remember what he told you in Galilee? <laughs> Not only that, did you pick up on it? The angels knew that this particular group of women had actually heard the Lord Jesus prophesy his own resurrection. <laughs> How cool is that? Did you know that angels are here in this room today listening in on what I'm saying right now? Do you realize that they recognize every one of you? Because there's a group of angels that have been assigned to the people in this church. Hebrews 1.14. Do you think that there are times when they're wondering, why don't these people get it? Just like the angels at the tomb wondered why the women didn't get it. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Now look at the last phrase of that verse. And they remembered his words. That, dear friends, is the key. They remembered his words. 
Oh, that we might remember his words. It would keep us from the sorrows that fill our vision. It would keep us from the numb and mindless things that we do. It would keep us from thinking that we're only slogging along in unhappy trivia, preparing for the miserable task of serving the Lord. It would refocus our joy. It would give us a message like it gave the women. It would make our feet swift to bear the message. How much more quickly they must have returned from the tomb to spread the word than the slow steps they took in reaching it. I know the text doesn't say it, but I suspect that they dropped their bags filled with spices and ointments and raced back to tell the news. When they finally remembered the words and believed the words of Jesus, that changed everything. It did for them what it would clearly do for us. It would take our breath away as it must have done for the women. He is not here, but is risen. It would also remind us of where our Lord has gone. And it will remind us where we can find him. Believing the words of Jesus is the only remedy for pervasive confusion and fear. Believing his words, seeing his manifest proof is what brings peace. It is just as he said. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified in the third day rise again. Do you understand? That's the gospel. That's the good news by which we're saved according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 and Romans 1, 1 through 4. It's the good news that does not change. It is the good news that gives us hope. It is the good news that destroys the very gates of hell. It is the good news that raises dead men to spiritual life and liberty. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It is the gospel by which we are saved. Do you remember what we read about the disciples as we began this passage? They had the same reaction as the women. They were terrified. <laughs> but let's contrast their terror with the women. The women were in the dark. The women were a much smaller group in number. The women were out in the open in an abandoned cemetery where they, might have been, where they might have run into crazy men or wicked soldiers. But the men were inside. They were in a lighted room. And they were tough, hardened young men with muscles. Most of them had worked at hard manual labor as fishermen. But they were even more terrified than the women. Look at the words that are used. And they didn't even see powerful angels. They saw Jesus whom they had known so well. But what a strange premise they had. They were pragmatists. They had, brought into the, they had bought into the secular pagan worldview that when you're dead, you're dead. You see, they talked theology, but they didn't believe reality. They assumed that people don't come back to life but that you might see a ghost. Yes, premises make a lot of difference when our emotions come into play. But what a contrast when the premises are grounded on faith in the promises of the word of God. Jesus offered peace before the cross, and the first word he brings them after the cross is the word of peace. But that's not what the disciples got out of the encounter. The disciples clearly didn't have the right premises. Listen again to those verses that I just read. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Friends, when we start with the right assumptions, assumptions based on truth and reality, it brings peace. When we start with the wrong assumptions, any contact with supernatural beings brings abject terror. But do you see, do you see what it was that changed them from terrified rabbits into fearless lions? The last verse that I read in verse 45, look, what does it say? 
Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. The scriptures. The only way to have our wrong premises changed is to go back to the Bible. And when we do that, our fear turns into faith. Our panic turns into peace. Only then is there a transformation of our lives, just like there was a transformation in the lives of the apostles. Peace. How desperately the world around us wants peace. I try to listen to the news at five o'clock every morning on the radio, early morning. For weeks, the biggest news has been the saber rattling in Syria and North Korea, the Middle East, terrorism in Malaysia, ISIS and the mother of all bombs blowing out the, the stronghold of the terrorists, Turkey, Israel, troubles in Mexico, our neighbor to the south, threats surround us. Putin's Russia is hard and cold as they stand up for the dictatorships among their allies. China is inscrutable in what will be done about North Korea. Genocide is rampant. Ethnic minorities are having their girls and women systematically raped by the national soldiers. People are fleeing their ancestral lambs. Refugee camps are growing daily. The world will do anything for peace. Except turn to Christ. And yet the resurrection is the key to genuine peace. The resurrection is the key to lasting peace. The resurrection is the key to instant peace. Do you realize how often the New Testament speaks about peace? After the resurrection. There are 104 verses that speak about peace in the New Testament. Some verses even speak of peace twice, making that a total count of 111 uses of the word peace in the New Testament. Jesus promised peace to his followers in John 14, 27 and 16, 33. Both part of the upper room discourse. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus promised peace to his followers. Let me ask a personal question. Do you have it? Listen again. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. And peace was his very first greeting to the disciples after the resurrection. In fact, he said it three times in seven verses. John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at even, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Two verses later, verse 21, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Five verses later, verse 26, and after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. And that's why the New Testament is filled with words of peace. Because you see, it is the resurrection that gives us peace. Before we were controlled by the fear of death, the Bible says so. Remember Hebrews 
For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Get verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The resurrection removes fear. The resurrection gives peace. Our time is up, so we don't have time to look at all the verses, but let me just give you a few. Did you know it's God's design for you to have peace because of the resurrection of Christ? I have verses from Romans and 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, Hebrews. I'm just going to read through, not even going to give you references. I'm just going to read some of these verses. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. And bring glad tidings of good things. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy and joy in the Holy Ghost. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. Peace and the love of God and peace shall be with you. Grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be upon them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of the commandments contained in ordinance, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace, shall be with you. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly,
And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace, always by all means. The Lord be with you. And then these two wonderful verses from Hebrews 13. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that's the resurrection, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Yes, it's a simple story, but it is the most powerful, historic, true narrative in the history of the world. It is the truth of the resurrection of Christ. It is the truth without which we have no hope. It is the only message that can bring real peace. But it is also the truth that because it is true, we have God's gift of eternal life. And that brings peace. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Again, we thank you for the peace that we have in Christ. Not a dead Christ. Not some kind of pathetic ancient religious leader. But peace that comes because Christ is risen from the dead. And through death and resurrection, Christ destroyed the power of the devil who had all of our lives held us in the bondage of fear. But now because of the resurrection, there is no more fear, only faith. There is peace because we serve a risen Savior. How we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning.